I hope you have enjoyed this teaching series, Me and My Big Mouth. We're now on the final part and we've learned so much. We've learned about the importance of listening, being slow to speak and quick to listen. We looked at the necessity to be careful about the words we use, to ensure that the words we use build someone up rather than knock them down. But sometimes we have to admit that our feelings get in the way, that maybe bitterness that we hold over a person or unforgiveness causes us to speak in a way that doesn't help. In fact, it causes anger and more brokenness because words are stones and either we can use them to throw or we can use them to pave a new path, a new way. I want to tell you a story. It's a story that I loved as a kid. It's found in Genesis, the first book in the Bible. And um, it's probably a story that you may know from the West End musical. It's a story of Joseph. And um, just to back up a little bit before we delve into the story of Joseph, the Bible tells us that God decides to have a special relationship with one particular man, a guy called Abraham. And God tells Abraham that that God is going to be his God, that Abraham and his descendants, his family are going to be his people, that God would bless them, that God would be with them, he'd be on their side. And that through Abraham and his many descendants, God would bless the entire world. And Genesis goes through sort of what happens to Abraham and his immediate story. In fact, the whole Bible is a story of what happens to Abraham's descendants. Abraham has a son called Isaac. Isaac has a son called Jacob. Well, Esau and Jacob, but the, the story continues with Jacob. And then Jacob has 12 sons, which is a lot. And he had one particular favourite son, the son of his favourite wife, Rachel, called Joseph. And Joseph was one of those brothers who was really, really annoying. He would tell on his brothers. He would report back to his father uh, what mischief they'd been up to. And Jacob didn't help because he made it pretty obvious that Joseph was his favourite son. In fact, he bought him an amazing ornate coat, which Andrew Lloyd Webber calls a multicoloured dream coat. And this made Joseph's brothers incredibly jealous. And then Joseph really didn't help himself. He tells them of a dream where he dreams of what is pretty obvious, referring to his family bowing down to him at some point. And then one day, Jacob asks his son Joseph to go and check up on his brothers who were looking after the livestock. And Joseph goes off looking for them and they spot him far off and they decide that they are going to kill his, uh, their brother Joseph. But Reuben steps in and says, no, we're not going to kill Joseph. We're just going to maybe rough him up a little bit, teach him a lesson, stick him in a hole in the ground. And that's what they decide to do. They rough him up, stick him in uh, a cistern, a hole in the ground and leave him there. But what Reuben didn't know was going to happen that while he wasn't there, some traders, some Ishmaelites came along and um, Joseph's brothers saw an opportunity to finally get rid of Joseph and they sailed Joseph into slavery. Now we're told that Joseph gets taken to Egypt and sold by the Ishmaelites to a guy called Potiphar who was in the palace um, household. He was the captain of the guards. But in all this, we are told that God was with Joseph. You see, Joseph prospered during his time in Potiphar's household. He got to the stage where Potiphar put him in charge of everything. In fact, Potiphar didn't have to worry about anything within his household because Joseph was so good at doing his job. He was successful. He was talented, he was intelligent, but also the Bible tells us that he was good looking and well built. And he quickly drew the attentions of Potiphar's wife, who took quite a shine to Joseph. And she makes that pretty clear and proposition. She tries to seduce 
Joseph. But Joseph refuses. I'm not going to take advantage of the trust that has been placed into me and I'm not going to sin against God. He refuses. And Potiphar's wife insists. She keeps on asking. And then one day she grabs at Joseph and his cloak comes off and he runs off in his underwear. And Potiphar's wife takes this opportunity to basically cry for help, to shout out that Joseph had attacked her, that Joseph had made an indecent proposition to her. And Potiphar is absolutely livid at this and he chucks Joseph into prison. And yet we are told that God was with Joseph. And that even in the prison circumstances, Joseph prospered, Joseph did well. And just as in Potiphar's household, he was given a position of responsibility and authority, so too was he given the same sort of position within the prison. He was second only to the prison warden. Wait a minute, let's just stop for a minute because I'm not understanding this. Twice now in our story, it's told us that the Lord was with Joseph. And yet, if the Lord was with Joseph, then I can't see why he would have been sold by his brothers into slavery. If the Lord was with Joseph, it would be Potiphar's wife in prison, not Joseph. See, if the Lord is with you, you don't end up in prison. If the Lord is with you, you don't end up being best buddies with the prison warden. See, perhaps we have to realise that bad stuff has been happening to good people for a very long time. But also, God has been with good people going through bad things for a very long time too. Maybe we need to change our idea of what it means to be blessed by God, to have him with us in our lives. We're told that sometime later, two members of the palace household are thrown into prison. It's the chief cupbearer to the king, the pharaoh, and also they're his kind of chief baker, uh, I guess. I don't know what they did, but obviously they did something wrong and ended up in prison. And they are put under the responsibility of Joseph. And Joseph comes to them one morning and, and asks them, why are you looking so sad? It turns out both of them had had these dreams, different dreams that they knew was important somehow. I'm not going to go into details of the dream, you can look that up. But Joseph says, basically, look, I can interpret those dreams. And he gives an interpretation to the chief cupbearer. He tells him that this is a, a sign that you are going to end up back in your royal position. And when you do go back into that position, remember me. Don't forget me. I've been here in prison. It wasn't my fault. Remember me. And the baker thinks, great, that sounds good for the cupbearer. Maybe it'd be good for me. It turns out it really wasn't good at all. In fact, Joseph doesn't mince his words and he tells the baker he's going to die. And what's amazing is those dreams came true. The cupbearer ends up back in his royal position and the baker ends up impaled. It's lovely, isn't it? And although Joseph had asked the chief cupbearer to remember him, the chief cupbearer didn't remember him and Joseph remains in prison. Now it's some time later and the pharaoh has a really weird dream. It's a dream about fat cows and thin cows and plump corn and thin scrawny corn and it's weird as dreams usually are but the pharaoh realises he knows that this is something really important. This is something he, know, he needs to find out what it means. So he calls all his intellectuals, all his magicians together to bring an interpretation of the dream and none of them can work out what it means. None of them can decide what important message is trying to be told in this dream. And then the chief cupbearer has that ah moment and he remembers Joseph. He remembers the fact that Joseph had this ability, this power to interpret dreams. Actually those dreams, those interpretations came true. So he tells the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh summons Joseph from the prison and asks Joseph to interpret his dream. He explains the dream and Joseph says something <laughs> uh, really, really dangerous. He says, 
I can't interpret the dreams. And you can imagine the chief cutbread's going, oh dear, I'm going to end up back in prison again. And then even worse, Joseph then refers to God. I mean, Pharaoh was God. He was God to his people. And here we've got this Hebrew prisoner referring to God, big G. Pharaoh, you are little G. But God can interpret your dream because this is a message from God. And, and Joseph goes on to tell Pharaoh that this dream he's had about cows and corn. Actually, it's a, it's a message from God. It's telling them that as a country, they're going to have seven years of plenty. They're going to have seven years of, pl- of loads of food, amazing harvests. But then after those seven years, there's going to be seven years of famine in the land. And the reason that um, the pharaohs had this dream twice in two different ways is because God has set this in stone. This is definitely going to happen. But Joseph doesn't leave it there. He then comes up with a plan for Pharaoh about how they can get through this, how they can make sure that they have enough food to last them, to sustain them through those seven years of famine. And Pharaoh responds not only positively to the interpretation, but he likes what he sees in Joseph. He sees wisdom there. He sees something special. He sees that God is working through this young man. And he puts Joseph not only in charge of the relief project, but actually second in charge of the whole of Egypt. See, once again, God is prospering Joseph. Now, fast forward about nine years. They've had the seven years of plenty and are now in the depths of a seven year famine. It's a famine that's not just confined to Egypt, but to the whole of that area including the area where Jacob and his remaining 11 sons are living. And Jacob decides to send off his sons to Egypt to go and buy grain because they'd stored up grain during those seven years of plenty. They had plenty of food to last them during the famine. So those brothers set off. Little did they know that the man that they would be asking for food was their very own brother, Joseph. That brother who they had beaten and who they had sold into slavery all those years before. Now, I'm not gonna go into loads of details and encourage you to read the story uh, in Genesis, but Joseph recognizes his brothers straight away, but his brothers didn't recognize Joseph because Joseph was looking very, very different by this stage, it'd been a few years. And Joseph toys with his brothers. He finds out information about him and his family. He's particularly interested on, in how they would treat their youngest uh, brother, Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin. And finally, it gets to the stage where he just can't take it anymore. He sends out his officials, his courts, and he breaks down in tears and he tells his brothers that he is Joseph, the, the brother who they beat the brother who they sold into slavery, the brother whose life they ruined. And at that point, I think probably Joseph's brothers wet themselves at potentially what was gonna happen. I mean, really, they could have been executed quite happily, but Joseph doesn't respond that way. He basically says that God has been in all this, that God brought him into Egypt. It wasn't his brothers, it was God, because God had taken what they intended for evil and brought something good out of it. That because of what they had done all those years ago, that now Joseph was able to bring salvation to so many people. So let's stop for a moment and just put yourself in Joseph's position. What would you do if you were faced with a bunch of guys who some years previous had beaten you up, stuck you in a hole hole in the ground, sold you into slavery, and caused this life where Joseph has been up and down in prison and all sorts of things? How would you respond? Not only are you meeting them, but you have the power of life and death over them. See, you have a decision here. 
How are you going to respond? What words are you going to use? Are you going to use words as if they're stones and throw them? Or are you going to use words as stones to pave a way to a new relationship? See, I think the important thing here is we look back over the story of Joseph, that even when it didn't seem like God was with Joseph, Joseph lived as if God was with him. And that we see time and time again, Joseph prospering in everything he did. And that people saw something different about Joseph. They saw that God was with him. I'm not sure that would have happened if Joseph had been constantly thinking back to all the wrong things that had been done against him, of which there were many. I don't think that would have happened if Joseph was consumed by bitterness and unforgiveness for his brothers. And I don't think Joseph would have responded in the way that he did to his brothers. If he'd spent his whole life just waiting and plotting revenge against all those that had wronged him. You see, Joseph recognised an important thing, that God was with him. And that what his brothers had intended for bad, God had used for good. That God had used Joseph, that God had taken Joseph into Egypt and had been with him every single step of the way, however much it may have seemed the opposite at the time. God was with Joseph. So therefore, when that time came, for Joseph to speak words, Joseph spoke out of forgiveness rather than bitterness because he knew that God had been in this every step of the way. So my challenge to you is to consider your own life, to look back and also look forward as you move into your life, not just about the past but about the present and the future as well. Are you going to hold on to bitterness? and unforgiveness? Or are you going to let go and see God in every situation? Because that will determine ultimately the words you use and therefore the relationship that you have with people. Are your words going to knock people down or are they going to build people up? Are they going to form relationships or are they going to break relationships apart? And are you going to end up as a person that sees the good in all things and all people? Or are you going to be a person that is bowed down by unforgiveness and bitterness in their hearts? See, ultimately, this isn't about the words you say. Ultimately, this is a heart issue because from the heart, the mouth speaks.